Would you like to be rich? Do you want to have a prosperous life and at the same time have a balanced spiritual life? This video is full of wisdom and wealth and everything that will be said here is recorded in the Holy Scriptures with the main teachers being Jesus and Solomon. Solomon was one of the wisest and richest men in the Bible. And Jesus also gives numerous teachings about wealth and wisdom. But you didn't realize this when you read the Bible. So don't miss this video for anything, because you will see the three main teachings of Solomon that made him very rich. The 10 teachings of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus teaches very valuable things that will help your financial progress. Then you will see the eight enriching habits according to the Bible. Right after, you will see the seven secrets of Solomon for wealth and wisdom. Following that, you will learn about the five impoverishing habits according to the Bible. And finally, you will check the three mistakes that you must not make. If you commit any of these three mistakes, you will jeopardize your finances. The entire video is based on the Holy Scriptures. Pay extra attention because we are starting now. Discover now the three keys that will give access to Solomon, and that was why he became a wise and rich king. That Solomon, son of King David, was one of the wealthiest and wisest men in humanity. You already know, but what would be the secret of his wealth? Is there a universal wealth code that King Solomon used to become so rich? The answer is yes, and in fact, there are three main codes responsible for Solomon's wealth. However, one of these codes is hidden in the Bible, and today you can access this code to open the doors to wealth and prosperity, as well as anything else you wish to manifest. Today, we will discuss a topic that surely interests you, three codes for you to become rich. But it's not just any code. These are codes accessed by King Solomon, and you can access them too. The truth is that if you access these codes, a universe of possibilities may open up before you, and not only wealth, money, and prosperity. Because not everyone knows, but I tell you, wealth is very subjective. Each interprets wealth according to their level of consciousness. However, accessing this code, which I also call principles, and which King Solomon accessed and took possession of, will connect you with an unlimited source. These codes go far beyond just attracting wealth, as they are responsible for three things, manifestation, maintenance, and overflow. This is the tripod of true prosperity. If you have been following me for some time, you know that my purpose is to share what I have learned in a very simplified, clear way that anyone can understand. Now that you've come this far, how about leaving your like? If you're new here on the channel, remember to subscribe and activate the bell. The video may be long, but it is valuable knowledge, so pay attention and stay until the end. It's great to have you here. I'm proud to see you being part of this. Before revealing Solomon's three codes, pay attention here. I know that many will raise objections about Solomon's figure and his wealth, saying, Oh, but Solomon was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Others will say that Solomon made several mistakes, and others will say other things like Solomon's temple was destroyed and is in ruins. Therefore, we should not worship wealth because wealth leads to ruin. Let me tell you something about wealth. Those who have awareness of wealth understand that it generates opportunities for choices and simply amplifies our virtues if we look at them, as well as amplifies our imperfections if we focus and pay attention to them. The fact that Solomon was born with a silver spoon, being the son of King David, would not guarantee maintaining the wealth, power, and authority that his father had. Similarly, if you win a lottery prize, it will not guarantee your wealth. It needs something more, and we will discuss that. Another thing that is also very important to emphasize is that many judge King Solomon for his supposed mistakes. So I ask you, who is perfect? The big problem is that people seek perfection, idolize politicians, celebrities, artists, religious leaders, and when they discover the mistakes of these people, they become disappointed and simply condemn them for their imperfections or mistakes and not for their virtues. Note that getting rich will not guarantee your eternal wealth, but if you take possession and use eternal principles that never die, then you can manifest, maintain, 
and share wealth. It is worth emphasizing the following. The purpose of this video is for you to pay attention to the codes that Solomon accessed. My interest is by no means to impose any religious idea about what I believe and what I don't believe, or any idea whatsoever. The aim of this channel is not to alienate you. On the contrary, it is to make you think freely and on your own, determine what makes sense for you. Now let's get to the codes and pay attention because I will leave the most important code for last. So I ask again, please stay until the end of the video. God appeared to Solomon in a dream and said, Ask me for anything and I will give it to you. Solomon replied, Give me wisdom and knowledge so that I can lead this nation. God told Solomon that he would receive what he asked for, but he would also give him wealth, possessions, and honor. Well, you may or may not know this, but Solomon was very young when he ascended the throne. According to what is written in the Bible, he did not know what to do or how to reign. What Solomon asked of God was wisdom and discernment to be able to govern his people, even though he possessed great wealth and was the heir of King David, who was very loved by his people. Solomon understood that wealth alone was not enough to maintain the reign and authority that his father had left him. Here, we enter the first code that Solomon accessed and took possession of, which is wisdom to govern. We can clearly see through Solomon's life that to maintain wealth, wealth alone would not suffice. To govern, maintain his wealth, and multiply it as he did in his years of reign, greed had to give way to discernment. Solomon wrote in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 16, how much better to get wisdom than gold, to get insight rather than silver. In chapter 17, verse 16, he adds, of what use is money in the hand of a fool, since he has no desire to get wisdom? Your greatest desire should not be for wealth. Your greatest desire should be for wisdom, and more than that, to continually acquire more wisdom. Wisdom and discernment will be responsible for manifesting, maintaining, and multiplying wealth, as well as being respected by the world around you. Let me tell you something, wealth is already available to you, but you need to be mentally prepared to see it and truly manifest it in your life. You can work on your mindset to receive it. Well, the second code of Solomon to get rich is about taking possession. This means taking action. Pay close attention now. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. It is of no use to acquire wisdom if you do not use that wisdom to your advantage and take action. Tell me, do you really think Solomon simply received a download of wisdom from above, or did God gift him with opportunities so that he could take possession of wisdom and thus be considered the wisest king of his time? What do you think about it? Share your opinion in the comments section. Look, let me tell you something. I do believe that we can indeed have a certain connection with infinite wisdom. We'll discuss more about this in code number three. However, this wisdom is only true wisdom when we put it into practice. Otherwise, it's just knowledge. Living in the age of knowledge, where everything we want is at our fingertips, we know that excess knowledge becomes an overdose if we don't put it into practice. It's pointless to take a course or read a book about investment from a wealthy author if we don't take action or implement what the author is teaching. In every effort, there is gain. But merely staying in words leads to poverty. Wisdom is only wisdom when we put it into practice. Is it clear? I hope so. Leaving aside what Solomon taught and entering into the ask, believe and receive that Jesus taught, I need to open your eyes. Most people who start studying the law of attraction, metaphysics, new thought and positive thinking think that receiving is simply meditating and waiting for the best. At first I thought the same way, and of course I'm not suggesting thinking about the worst. But understand something, receiving, as taught by Jesus, means taking possession of what is yours. The verb receive in Latin means to take back or to take possession of. But how do you take it back? Pay attention. Taking it back is accessing in the physical plane what has already been clearly manifested in your mind. 
I won't go into details today about this topic to avoid making the video too long. But for our conversation to be beneficial today, take what was said with care. Receiving and taking possession is taking action, putting into practice the acquired knowledge, as well as the ideas coming from your clear intention. Believe me, when you have a clear intention and use the next code, code number three, which I'll reveal with action, things simply happen. Returning to Solomon's example when he asked for wisdom, it's interesting to note, after the conversation between God and Solomon in a dream, when God said he would give Solomon not only wisdom and discernment, but also wealth and fame, something happens in the first book of Kings, in chapter 3 and verse 16 onward, putting into action the wisdom that Solomon asked God for, not just being a download, at least I believe it's not simply a download. You probably already know this story, but if you don't, it's quite interesting. One day, two prostitutes appeared before the king. One of them said, Oh my lord, this woman and I live in the same house. I gave birth to a son, and she was with me in the house three days after my son was born. This woman also gave birth to a son. We were alone. There was no one else in the house. One night, this woman lay on her son, and he died. Then she got up in the middle of the night and took my son while I was asleep and placed him next to her, putting her dead son beside me. When I woke up early to nurse my son, he was dead. But when I examined him closely in the morning, I saw that he was not the son I had given birth to. The other woman said, No, the living child is mine and the dead one is yours. But the first insisted, No, the dead child is yours and the living one is mine so they argued before the king. Then the king commanded, bring me a sword and cut the living child in half, giving half to one woman and half to the other. The mother of the living child, moved by maternal compassion, cried out, please, my lord, give the living child to her, do not kill him. The other woman, however, said, it shall be neither mine nor yours, cut it in half. Then King Solomon rendered his verdict, do not kill the child, Give him to the first woman. She is his mother. When all Israel heard the king's verdict, they respected him deeply, seeing that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. Pay attention to the last sentence of this passage. When all Israel heard the king's verdict, they respected him deeply, seeing that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. So it means that perhaps before, the people of Israel did not believe that a young man would have the wisdom to reign and manage wealth. Solomon had to prove this by exercising his role as king, and more than that, putting the acquired wisdom into action. If you truly understand what was said, write in the comments the following sentence to fix this knowledge in your mind. To manifest wealth, I put into action the acquired wisdom. I'll repeat. To manifest wealth, I put into action the acquired wisdom. And if you want, you can pause this video to write. It is very important that you write this sentence, as it will condense and validate what we have discussed so far. Well, I will assume that you have already written it, and I will continue. Solomon's third code is almost imperceptible in the Bible and is related to honor gratitude and sincerity. Pay attention to this point because it is essential. Solomon loved the Lord as demonstrated by walking according to the decrees of his father David, but he also offered sacrifices and burned incense in the sacred places. King Solomon went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices as it was the main sacred place. It's good to repeat, it was the main sacred place and he offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. Let me tell you something about this. I'm by no means saying that I agree with burnt offerings and animal sacrifices. That doesn't make sense to me. However, in the time when Solomon lived, this practice was common and, through the consciousness of his era, demonstrated an act of gratitude. And that's the point I want to make. Solomon had a sincere and very grateful heart. This is well observed when God in a dream makes the following declaration to Solomon, ask me what you want and I will give it to you. Now look at Solomon's response. You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. 
you have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. Now, my Lord God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I am only a young man and do not know what to do. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a people so great that it cannot be counted. Therefore, give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. Solomon, even before asking for and accessing the wisdom that would make him one of the richest and wisest men in the history of humanity, according to the Bible, the wealthiest and wisest man of his time, had a grateful and sincere heart. My friend, before anything else, be grateful, sincere, and clear about what you want. I sincerely hope that you understand that wisdom is worth more than gold, that diligent hands manifest wealth, and if you don't know what it means to have diligent hands, research it, okay? And there's more. A grateful and sincere heart has a connection with the infinite source, where all the answers and solutions lie. Check out now the 10 main teachings of Jesus that talk about wealth. You will learn from the best master of all time the path to prosperity, so stay tuned. Did you know that in the Bible, there are teachings about finances that are fundamental for us to lead a dignified life? These are teachings that, if not learned and put into practice, can put you in serious trouble, making your life much more difficult than it should be if you followed these teachings. Today, we will get to know some of these teachings, specifically those spoken in the Sermon on the Mount. Stay until the end of the video if you want to know what these teachings are and how to improve your life through them. The Sermon on the Mount is certainly one of Jesus' most well-known discourses. At the top of the mountain, north of the Sea of Galilee, now known as the Mount of Beatitudes, the Master delivered a long, comprehensive and profound teaching. This teaching reveals essential principles for an authentic Christian life. In this sermon, which for many summarizes Christ's main teachings, topics such as happiness, prayer, fasting, moral ethics, love, and many others are addressed, including financial teachings. Here. The Master teaches about financial priorities, accepted and rejected donations, financial issues, wealth accumulation, and the divine desire to bless us. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus spoke a lot about money, and here we will learn about the 10 financial lessons from the Sermon on the Mount. Do you know any Bible teaching that instructs how to deal with money? Comment below. Share what you know, even if it's not much, because you're here precisely to learn with us how to actively improve your life through knowledge. Leave your like and subscribe. Thus, you'll be helping our content reach people who need this knowledge. The Sermon on the Mount, or the Mount Sermon, is fully recorded in the Gospel of Matthew in chapters 5, 6, and 7. Besides this record, there are also excerpts in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 6. As Matthew's account is more detailed, we'll extract the main lessons from it. The first financial lesson from the Sermon on the Mount, give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Matthew chapter 6 verse 12. Many misinterpret this verse in two points. First, Jesus did not mention lending to the one who asks, but giving to the one who asks. Giving is different from lending. I'm not very favorable towards lending money to friends and family. In my opinion, if we are able, the best we can do is give. That way we won't risk losing money or friendship, nor harm the family relationship. The second point, in my opinion, that people misinterpret what Jesus said. Many think that whenever someone asks for alms, we should give what was asked for. But that's not what Jesus said. He said, give to the one who asks you. But he did not say, give to the one who asks you what they ask for. There is a small but important difference here, because not always what someone asks for is what that person really needs. Someone asking for alms may need prayer and attention. Someone asking for food may need help to get back into the workforce. Someone asking for money may actually need a rehabilitation clinic for substance dependence. You don't always have to give what is requested. Remember what Peter did when he received a request for alms from a lame man at the temple gate. 
He said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Acts chapter 3 verse 6. Are you enjoying the video? Do you realize the extent of the wisdom that God has left us through the Bible? Comment on what you think about God's infinite wisdom and about the manual of life. When you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Matthew chapter 6 verse 2. There are people who donate not to help, but to receive applause, compliments, and social recognition for being considered good and virtuous. This motivation is widely condemned by Christ. However, note that Christ's disapproval lies in the motivation to display the good deed. I want to make it clear that those who participate in charity, work and receive donations to carry them out, need to show what they did with those donations. They need to announce the good deed they performed. However, this should not be done for personal benefit. As Jesus said in the next verse, But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Matthew chapter 6 verse 3. The third financial lesson from the Sermon on the Mount. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Matthew chapter 6 verse 19. Where have you been focusing more? On earth or in heaven? Of course, our life on earth is important because it will determine what our eternity will be like. However, earthly life is almost insignificant compared to eternity. Eighty years here are irrelevant compared to eternity in heaven. Therefore, it makes no sense to deposit all your treasure in your earthly bank and neglect the treasure that can be deposited in your heavenly bank. Your time in eternity will be greater, much greater than your time on earth. Moreover, your treasure in the heavenly bank does not lose purchasing power due to inflation. However, just like in the verses of the previous financial lessons, I believe this one is also misunderstood by many. After all, some people, when reading, do not store up treasures for yourselves on earth, think that saving money is a sin. I'll say something that might change your perspective on this point. Listen. Money was made to be used, not to spend or accumulate. To explain further, using refers to something that you do consciously, with purpose and aim. Money was made to be used for feeding, sheltering, taking care of your health, assisting the kingdom, contributing, offering, having entertainment, receiving a good education, and also providing a good education for your children. This is contrary to the idea of spending money. Spending sends the message of lack of purpose. Spending money is like succumbing to consumerism, getting into credit card debt, and spending on things that do not bring satisfaction, as Prophet Isaiah strongly advised against in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 5. In this sense, money was also not made just to be accumulated. You shouldn't just keep money to swim in a pool of bills like Uncle Scrooge did. The money you save must have a purpose, a utility. You save and invest to have a retirement, live on income, and thus contribute more to the kingdom, providing a more dignified life for you and your family. This is approved and recommended by the sacred scriptures. Fourth financial lesson from the Sermon on the Mount. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew chapter 6 verse 21. The way we use and spend our money reveals what we truly value. Want to know if you value God's work? Look at your bank statement as it clearly shows where your heart is. It indicates whether you value the kingdom, whether you love your neighbor, your family, as well as revealing whether you care about your intellectual progress, if you seek and love wisdom. And about wisdom, it's worth saying, if you never make any investment in education, you don't value wisdom, because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Fifth financial lesson, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Matthew chapter 6 verse 24. In this life, some choices are binary. That is, you choose one thing or another. 
You cannot choose both. You can only have one top priority in life. There can only be one first place in your heart. And that place needs to be occupied by God, not by money, not by riches, not by material possessions. Sixth financial lesson, do not live anxious about financial matters. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 and 27. Of course, you should be concerned with life's basic needs and consequently with work, business and career. The point Jesus emphasizes here is your heart. You shouldn't live anxiously about these needs. You should work, do your part, and not worry. Not living anxiously, in other words, means focusing on what's within your reach. What goes beyond that should not generate anxiety. What's beyond that is God's concern, and He is faithful. You can control much of what you do. You can decide to work, strive, become a better professional, dedicate yourself to learning a new language, pursue further education. However, you cannot control if a financial crisis will hit the country. You have no control if a health crisis occurs. Do you see where I'm going with this? Agricultural work illustrates this very well. The farmer can plant at the right time in the right soil, manage pests well, etc., but cannot control the weather. Nothing can be done to ensure that the rains come at the right time and in the right amount. Do what you can and do not worry about your sustenance. For the Lord is your sustenance, as we will see in the next financial lesson from the Sermon on the Mount. Seventh financial lesson. Do not be anxious, for God will take care of you. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. Your sustenance doesn't come from your job, some government aid, your retirement, your spouse, not even your child. Your sustenance comes from God, from the Lord who owns everything, the owner of gold and silver. Having this conviction is liberating because even if you lose your job, even if you face health problems, even if a crisis hits you, you will be sure that there will be sustenance. After all, a company can go bankrupt, but God does not. A job can end, but God does not end. A means of sustenance may cease to exist, but the source of sustenance never ceases to exist. The Lord is eternal. He lives forever. The kingdom of God, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. Eighth financial lesson, prioritize the kingdom of God, seek his kingdom first. However, be aware of what I'm saying, I mention priority, not exclusivity. Jesus did not say, seek only the kingdom and righteousness. He did not state, seek exclusively the kingdom and forget your work, your business, your children, your spouse, your parents, no, no, and no. He said, seek first his kingdom. The kingdom should take priority. Ninth financial lesson from the Sermon on the Mount. Ask the Lord, seek and you will be given. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Matthew. The other day, talking to a friend, we realized that lately most people facing a problem turn to all friends, family, Google, YouTube, etc. Except to God. When we wake up with an illness, we usually take a medicine or consult a doctor first, only then do we pray. In case of an accident, the ambulance is the first to be called God the second. It's necessary to return to the roots of the gospel. If you have a problem, request the solution first from God and in his word. But be attentive, know how to ask, for we ask and do not receive because we ask wrongly. If a drug addict asks for money, it wouldn't be good to provide money to them. It's not always best to give money to someone in need. Sometimes it's better to offer the means for them to get out of difficulty. It's not always more advantageous to just give the fish. It's usually wiser to teach how to fish. Don't act like many beggars out there. Don't just ask for the fish from God. Ask him to teach you how to fish. Yes, if you're in a complicated situation, you'll need the fish today. 
It's not a sin to ask for the fish, but the fish runs out quickly. Tomorrow, you'll need more. Now what you learn, what you know is endless. Remember Solomon's request. He asked God for wisdom, not for wealth, not for fame. He didn't ask for the fish. He asked for wisdom to fish. Do the same as Solomon. Tenth financial lesson from the Sermon on the Mount. For if you, who are evil, know how to give good things to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Matthew, this goodness of God is hardly understood by many. Some people have an exclusively punitive image of God, one that constantly punishes his creation. Yes, God is just, but he is also love, and he desires good things for you. He also has good plans for you, and if your heart reaches a point where money won't negatively affect it, these plans will also reach your financial life. Bonus financial lesson. Be careful where you build your house. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Matthew chapter 7 verse 24. You have encountered here ten profound financial lessons from the Sermon on the Mount. First, give. Second, give, but not to be seen. Third, do not accumulate treasures on earth. Fourth, your heart is where your treasure is. Fifth, money competes with God for dominion of your heart. Sixth, do not live anxious about financial matters. Seventh, do not be anxious for God will take care of you. Eighth, prioritize the kingdom of God. Ninth, ask the Lord. Tenth, the Lord wants to give you good things. Jesus said that knowing all this and not practicing this knowledge is like building a house on sand where rain and wind knock it down. You don't want to have your house on sand, you want a house on the rock. Yes, it's hard to build a house on the rock. It takes time to lay the foundations. It's not easy, but the result is a house that is hardly, very hardly destroyed. A house that will remain for years on end. A house that will shelter you, your children, and your children's children. This house is called practical action, and as Proverbs 13.16 says, A prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool exposes his folly. Look closely at this list and start acting. Start building your house. It's the place where step by step it shows you everything you need to know to get out of debt, increase your income, and achieve financial independence. The Bible talks about different habits that if you practice, you can get rich faster. So now, check out the eight habits that will make you prosperous, according to the Holy Bible. Have you ever wondered why some people manage to progress financially, while others seem to be stuck? The reality lies in the importance of financial habits in achieving prosperity, and the Holy Bible instructs us on how we should act to achieve financial prosperity. It's not solely about government policies or income distribution. To a large extent, your financial situation is a result of your decisions. Therefore, I invite you to embark on this journey and explore the eight enriching habits according to the teachings of the Bible. Are you willing to acquire knowledge about applying biblical principles to your personal financial management? If so, sign up and activate notifications for our channel. It's relevant to emphasize from the outset that the Bible does not promise financial wealth to anyone, including faithful Christians. However, those who follow its financial guidance have a greater likelihood of achieving prosperity in spiritual, familial, and financial aspects. This doesn't mean requesting divine riches, but adopting enriching practices, and that's precisely what we aim to explore. Are you ready to discover the eight enriching habits as revealed in the Holy Bible? Stay with us and incorporate these principles into your financial management. The first successful habit to enrich according to the Bible is diversifying income sources. As the popular saying goes, don't put all your eggs in one basket applies crucially to income management. Imagine having only one source of income, like a job or your own business. If that single source dries up, you'll be left without means of support, both for yourself and your family. Therefore, it's essential to have multiple income sources. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 11, verse 6, we find the guidance, Sow your seed in the morning, and do not be idle in the evening, for you do not know whether morning or evening sowing will succeed, or whether both of them alike will be good. 
This teaches us to constantly seek new opportunities and diversify our activities to ensure multiple income sources. Thus, if one weakens, others can continue to sustain you. However, it's crucial not to neglect commitment to what you already have. Dedication and excellence in each income source are essential for success. Diversifying income sources isn't just about having multiple jobs or investments, but also about exploring different skills and talents. The mentioned verse teaches us to sow both in the morning and in the evening, highlighting the importance of seizing all opportunities life offers. This means considering complementary activities or parallel projects that not only increase your earnings, but also enrich your experience and skills. Furthermore, diversifying income also provides a greater sense of financial security. Having several income sources not only reduces the risk of depending entirely on a single source, but also offers flexibility to deal with economic and professional changes. Therefore, this habit aims not only for financial growth, but also for building a solid and resilient foundation to face life's uncertainties. The second habit to enrich, according to the Holy Bible, relates to investments. Investing is fundamental for those aiming for financial freedom. The practice of investing involves making money work for you, contributing to the achievement of financial independence. The parable of the talents, found in the book of Matthew, chapter 25, teaches that God gives us talents to multiply them. This also applies to financial resources. It's natural to feel apprehensive when starting the habit of investing, such as opening an account with a brokerage or choosing financial products for investment. However, one cannot allow fear to prevent this important decision, as investing is the key to building a more prosperous financial life. Therefore, don't let fear or lack of knowledge hinder your investment in your financial life. Over time, you will gain confidence and begin to reap positive results. Remember that all the resources we have belong to God, and He wants us to use them wisely. Moreover, investing challenges us to develop financial management skills and make responsible decisions. As we educate ourselves and gain experience in the world of investments, we improve our ability to manage money effectively. These skills not only benefit us financially, but also extend to other areas of our lives, such as personal and professional decision-making. Just as the parable of the talents teaches us to multiply the resources given to us, the act of investing leads us to be faithful stewards of our financial resources. By investing wisely and responsibly, we fulfill an important part of our responsibility as stewards of the resources entrusted to us by God. Therefore, view investment as a journey of financial and personal growth, remembering that consistent practice leads to perfection and the achievement of the financial freedom we desire. The third habit that enriches according to the Bible is financial planning. Financial responsibility is a value taught in the Bible. In Luke chapter 14, verse 28, Jesus advises us to plan before acting. He said, For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? This emphasizes the importance of managing our resources wisely, avoiding waste, and making informed financial decisions. Planning helps prevent future problems and guides us towards financial stability. Financial planning is a valuable tool for achieving goals and dreams, whether in personal, familial, or business spheres. It is a principle that reminds us of the importance of living responsibly and being prepared to face financial challenges that may arise. The Bible encourages us to think long-term to save and invest in our future, thus ensuring the security of our family and the ability to help those in need. Additionally, financial planning also teaches us to be grateful for what we have and not to covet material possessions excessively. Greed and the unrestrained pursuit of wealth can lead us to moral and ethical problems. By adopting balanced financial planning, we are encouraged to live simply, focusing on more meaningful values such as love, compassion, and service to others. Therefore, the practice of financial planning becomes an expression of caring for others, 
and a commitment to an ethical and altruistic lifestyle. In summary, financial planning, in light of biblical teachings, is a path to a more balanced and meaningful life. It helps us manage our resources responsibly, build a secure future, and maintain a grateful and generous heart. Planning our finances wisely and consciously is an act of fidelity to Christian principles that aim not only for individual well-being, but also for the construction of a fairer and more compassionate society. The fourth habit that enriches, according to the Bible, involves living by spending significantly less than what is earned, that is, spending below one's income level and not consuming all available resources. Biblical wisdom instructs us, as mentioned in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 20, to store food and oil at home while the fool consumes everything he has. This implies managing financial resources prudently and avoiding consumerism's lack of control. Living in a way that spends significantly less than what is earned does not mean living a miserable life, depriving oneself of everything, but rather recognizing the finiteness of resources and using them wisely, spending less than what is earned to direct resources towards future investments. Recalling the story of Joseph, God instructed him to make Egypt live below its means during the seven years of abundance in order to save resources to face the seven years of scarcity. This teaching emphasizes the importance of living moderately to thrive even in challenging times, as stated in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 20. To practice this habit, it is necessary to exercise discipline and financial planning discerning between real needs and superfluous items, as well as saving on daily expenses to ensure resources for future priorities. It is crucial to understand that living below the standard of living that your salary allows is not a simple task, but is feasible. It requires courage to make difficult decisions and give up certain comforts in the present for a more promising financial future. Living moderately not only brings financial stability, but also reduces the pressure and stress often associated with rampant consumerism. When you avoid spending all your money on non-essential items, you can create a financial reserve that protects you against emergencies and provides peace of mind. This wise and balanced approach to finances not only benefits your life, but also positively influences future generations by setting a model of financial responsibility to be followed. Furthermore, living moderately opens doors to investments that can drive your long-term financial growth. By saving and directing available resources toward intelligent investments, you can make your money work for you, generating passive income and increasing your wealth. Financial prudence is not just a virtue, but also a pathway to achieving your goals and dreams, becoming a truly enriched person in all areas of life. Therefore, this habit establishes the foundations for a more solid and rewarding financial journey. It enriches, according to the Bible, involves creating an emergency fund. As it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 1, no one knows when trouble will come. It's never possible to predict when a financial emergency will occur. Hence, it's wise to maintain a reserve for contingencies. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 12 highlights Wisdom protects like money, but the advantage of knowledge is this, wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. Thus, financial wisdom involves having an emergency fund to guard against unforeseen circumstances. Generally, it is recommended to save six to 12 months worth of essential expenses in an easily accessible account, covering housing, food, healthcare, and other fundamental expenses. An emergency fund helps prevent debt and maintains financial stability during challenging periods. Building this reserve requires discipline by cutting unnecessary expenses and allocating the saved amount to the fund. Although this process may take time, financial discipline is crucial in establishing a solid base. Additionally, an emergency fund provides a sense of security and tranquility. When you know you are prepared to face unexpected financial challenges, you can handle stressful situations more balancedly and focus on your long-term financial goals. This helps reduce financial pressure and improves your quality of life. 
However, it's important to note that building an emergency fund should not be seen as an isolated goal, but as part of a comprehensive financial plan. Once you have your emergency fund in place, you can direct your resources toward investments that allow your money to grow and work for you, creating a financially secure and prosperous future. Thus, the fifth habit that enriches according to the Bible not only guards against contingencies, but also opens doors to a more promising financial future. The sixth habit that enriches according to the Bible is the continuous pursuit of wisdom. This is undoubtedly the most fundamental of all habits. Based on biblical wisdom, as in Proverbs chapter 3 verse 13, happy is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding, for wisdom is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. It is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with it. Can com teaches us that wisdom is an invaluable treasure and those who seek it are blessed. Wisdom isn't limited to mere knowledge. It also involves the wise use of that knowledge. Seeking wisdom means acquiring knowledge on how to manage money responsibly and efficiently. This includes understanding investments, financial budgets, economics, and long-term financial planning. When we apply wisdom to our finances, we can avoid impulsive decisions and ensure a more stable financial future. It's crucial to seek knowledge in various aspects of life, including finances, relationships, health, and spirituality. In the financial realm, this involves learning to handle money sensibly. In summary, financial wisdom is the path to avoiding recklessness and building a solid financial future. Therefore, it is never too late to seek wisdom, learn from past mistakes, and acquire the knowledge that makes us wiser and capable of growth in all areas of life. Remember that wisdom is more valuable than rubies, and those who act with discernment thrive. Let us then seek wisdom and build a richer and fuller life. The seventh habit that enriches according to the Bible is working diligently. The Bible teaches us to value diligent and dedicated work as a path to achieving success and prosperity. In Proverbs chapter 12, verse 27, we find the following teaching, The lazy do not roast any game, but the diligent feed on the riches of the hunt. This means that effort and diligence are rewarded, and achieving our goals requires effort and constant work. Working with dedication helps us use the gifts that God has given us to thrive. Furthermore, the importance of diligent work is emphasized in several other biblical passages. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, it is said, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. This reminds us that our effort at work should reflect our devotion to God and that He will reward our diligence. Therefore, diligent work not only brings material prosperity, but also strengthens our spiritual connection. Diligent work is also a means of serving others and being a blessing to society. Through our constant effort and dedication to our work, we can contribute to the well-being of the community in which we live. In Galatians 6, 9, we find a powerful encouragement. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. This encourages us to persist in diligent work, even in the face of challenges, knowing that eventually we will see the fruits of our effort and be agents of positive change in the world around us. In summary, the Bible teaches us that diligent work is a fundamental principle for achieving success and prosperity. It reflects our devotion to God, allowing us to use our gifts and talents to bless others, rewarding us not only materially, but spiritually as well. Therefore, let us strive to be diligent in our daily activities, knowing that through this constant effort, we are following divine teachings and contributing to a better world. The eighth habit that enriches according to the Bible is generosity. Generosity is a fundamental principle in the Bible. In Luke chapter 6 verse 38, Jesus teaches us about the importance of giving. He said, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. 
This means that when we are generous, we bless others and in turn receive blessings. Generosity is an act of love and compassion that brings us closer to God and strengthens our relationships. Generosity goes beyond simply donating material goods. It also involves giving time, attention, and kindness. When we practice generosity, we demonstrate empathy and concern for the well-being of others. Generosity is an important pillar in building a supportive and loving community where people support each other in times of need. Furthermore, generosity is not limited to individual actions, but can be incorporated into institutions and organizations. Many churches and non-profit organizations have generosity as one of their fundamental principles, seeking to help the less fortunate and promote a fairer and more equitable society. Through donations and social projects, generosity has the power to transform lives and communities, providing hope and opportunities for those most in need. However, it's important to practice generosity with an open and selfless heart, without expecting immediate rewards. True generosity stems from altruistic love and genuine compassion for others, without the expectation of receiving something in return. By following this principle, we can fulfill Jesus' teachings and experience the joy of making a difference in people's lives and strengthening our spiritual connection with the divine. Which habit do you think is important that I forgot to mention? Besides these, there are many habits that are crucial for your spiritual and financial life. Discover now Solomon's Seven Secrets for Wealth and Wisdom. Long ago, there was a wise and wealthy king who helped the entire population of his kingdom. His work was so admired that his name can be seen in various passages of the Bible. King Solomon was a man who had a great connection with God and was also the first to build a temple of worship in Jerusalem. His rule, considered very wise, resulted in him receiving tons of gold per year, making him one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest, figures in history. But his relationship with his more than a thousand wives led him to lose everything he had gained. In the end, his grand palace and his great temple were obliterated, extinguished by other peoples. In today's video, we will discuss seven principles of King Solomon. But before that, let's summarize a brief history of his reign and his journey. If you're not subscribed to the channel yet, go ahead and subscribe now so you don't miss any of our videos. Today we're going to talk about the man considered the wisest and wealthiest in biblical history. Believe it or not, he had a fortune estimated at $2.8 trillion. This information was taken from a series of sites, including the most reliable economic sites, such as magazines, because we're in an internet age. So we researched these sites online to get this information. All the wealth they say Solomon possessed is very plausible because at that time some kings of Egypt also had such great wealth, so it's quite possible that Solomon achieved this. Remember, he was a great king whose fame preceded him, so let's get started with this video. I'll ask you right off the bat for about 30,000 likes, so I'll come back with more videos about Solomon. So come on guys, let's hit the target. Also comment. With the wisdom that God will give me, I will become rich. Positive energy, folks, that will bring you wealth, even the positive energy from your comment. And to show that we're with you on this journey, I'll leave a heart on your comment. Okay, now let's go. Solomon was the tenth son of King David, who reigned at that time for 40 years and six months. King David, the same one you're thinking of, yes, he's the one who brought down the giant Goliath with a stone to the head. Brave David, he had only one stone against a giant, obviously he would be killed. But because he trusted and asked God, that stone could bring down the giant and he became king. So he was king for 40 years and that's how he ended up having his sons, including Solomon. Solomon was the tenth son, right? So at that time, it was practically impossible for him to become king because by law, the crown must be given to the first son, the first son came. Then let's say something happened to the first son, the second one would come, then the third or fourth, you understand, right? He was the last, the 10th, but something happened. Amnon, Chiliab and Absalom, who were his three older brothers, the first, the second and the third died. 
So the fourth son in line was Adonijah, who was ruling the kingdom. When David started getting older, Adonijah then started kind of remotely commanding. Things in the kingdom were running. However, at that time, a prophet, Nathan, came and spoke to David. The new leader should be Solomon, the tenth son, who was very young at the time for that. At the time, Adonijah tried everything to stay in power but couldn't, and he swore to respect the command of his younger brother, Solomon. But what happened at the time, when a king died, Whoever took his place also took his harem. They had many women. They had a lot of women indeed. So David's harem would be given by the new king, and Adonijah was already involved with a woman at the time. He wanted to stay with this woman, wanted to make this relationship with the woman an excuse to continue being the king. Solomon, when he ascended and became king, even though very young, there was a confusion it's not known if he was 18 or 20 years old, but it was around that age. He became king and ordered the killing of his brother Adonijah. His brother was killed because of it. It was a time when people died more easily. It was harder to be a person at that time, so to speak. And that's how Solomon reigned from 971 BC to 931 BC. I'll explain, the order of the dates is decreasing because it's BC, so in the countdown it would be from 971 to 931. And just like his father, 40 years of reign, what happened? Solomon is an intelligent, very wise person. One day God spoke to him in a dream and said, you can ask for whatever you want. And he replied, I want to have the greatest wisdom in the world so I can govern a people and be very wise. I want wisdom. And God liked his request, so God gave him that wisdom. Of course, this is a summary of what happened. And so he became the wisest man in the world at that time. He was great at trade negotiation and began to amass much wealth. Obviously, he wouldn't be poor anymore because he was already king but he began to amass much wealth beyond what he already had. He began to invest, for example, in salt extraction there at the Dead Sea. He started working with that, a curiosity. Did you know that the word salary has its origin in the Latin salarium, which means payment with salt, in literal translation, price with salt. At the time, payment with salt was common, so they really used salt as if it were people's salary, more or less and he basically had one of these stations literally extracting money from the ground. With that, he generated much wealth. He started sending this salt to Ethiopia, to India, and he also commanded a good portion of trade in Arabia. According to reports based on the Bible, Solomon received 25 tons of gold in just one year. 25 tons of gold equivalent to $240 million. Perhaps it doesn't seem like much money. But considering the time Solomon lived in, we're talking about a lot of money, a whole lot. Solomon had numerous businesses, numerous sources of wealth. It is estimated that at his peak, he had 3,400 tons of gold, which when converted into dollars, who knows, he might have had a few trillions of dollars. He had a temple built of gold. Indeed, the first temple made for God in Jerusalem was built by him. He built a gigantic temple, which took seven years to be completed. He negotiated with the King of Tyre, a region known as Iran, establishing a strong connection with the king's family. Solomon, in turn, negotiated very well with him, even exchanging four tons of gold for land, a lot of land. Solomon possessed a phenomenal land, which covered a vast, gigantic area. So Iran, who was doing business with Solomon, sent several slaves to Solomon, to work on the construction of this great temple. And Solomon, in return, gave oil and some grains he also had. Amazing, because he took salt to various places and brought back a lot in return. But remember when I said that Solomon was the wisest man in the world? This was one of the businesses that made him generate wealth the most. Because he was very wise, Solomon had a lot of influence and consequently earned a lot of gold. Perhaps the most famous episode in Solomon's history is the episode from the beginning of his reign, when he heard that there was a problem in the middle of the city there, in the community. Two women had given birth on the same day and lived together. One slept on her son and killed him. 
During the night, she exchanged her dead son for the living son of the other. To resolve the case, they went to Solomon. One said that the living son was hers, and the other also claimed the same. Remembering that this is just a summary, so be it. The king ordered the child to be cut in half, giving half of the child to each woman. One of the women agreed and the other did not, saying they could give the child to the other woman, but please not kill the boy. Solomon concluded, this is a true mother who loves her child to the point of giving another person to spare him from death and handed the child to his true mother. This case earned him much respect among his people. The name Solomon generated much expectation in people due to his great respect and fame. Remember, I was talking about this Iram. This Iran also recommended another very important guy, who is Hiram Abif, who is another Iran. He is a symbol within Freemasonry. In the Masonic community, he is talked about a lot because he was a Freemason. He was the guy and the architects of the Temple of Solomon, which is one of the most sought after temples. At one point in his life, Solomon began to spend his wealth on women. It's true he had one because he already had 700 women in his harem and about 300 concubines, like a thousand women. That's a lot of women for one guy, isn't it? What do you think? Tell me in the comments. He had a thousand women, all covered in gold, with the most expensive clothes, with the most expensive adornments. And these women, some of them, began to distance him from God according to what is said in the Bible. And so, when he was distanced from God, he lost wisdom. And his sons, who were supposed to be wise, also lost wisdom. And Solomon's son, named Rehoboam, and Jeroboam, son of Nebat, from the tribe of Ephraim, divided the kingdom. The kingdom went on until it broke for good. The kingdom broke, and five centuries later, both the temple and the palace where Solomon existed were destroyed. Afterwards, they were rebuilt, but were destroyed again in the year 70 AD. After that, only the wall remained, the famous Western Wall. A very interesting and knowledgeable story, isn't it? Anyway, after this brief summary, perhaps not so brief, but knowledge is never too much, let's move on to the seven principles of King Solomon. Enough studying those who have tens of thousands of dollars, those who have millions of dollars, those who have billions of dollars, those who have billions of dollars. Now we will study those who have or have had trillions of dollars. King Solomon, the wisest and richest person to ever inhabit this planet. Before we begin with the principles that I've separated here that Solomon teaches us, I would like to ask you for something very important. You're like, of course, it costs you nothing and also helps our channel to grow and discern quality content through YouTube. And don't forget to comment on what you think of the video. Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs. It's an incredible book, especially if you seek wisdom to increase your level of wisdom and discernment to improve various areas of your life. Without further ado, let's start here with the first principle. The first principle is, wisdom condemns false merit. Let's go. What is merit? Merit has to do with you achieving something because you added value in some way. So, we make a video here. It reaches a million people, and the editor edited this video. This video was edited, right? This video was well edited, with a well-crafted script, and it reached you. So, this video, it was very good. It added value to you. It brings a result. That's merit. What is false merit? False merit is when you want something without actually deserving it. For example, you are in a job where you work nine hours a day and you believe you deserve to earn more. Simply because without considering whether your work is really that difficult or vital. Or like, you won the lottery. Oh, but you can't win without playing. At least he played. It's his merit for betting. He deserves it. No, statistically speaking, impossible. There's no merit in that. So. False merit is when you didn't add value and this happened, or when you think you deserve it without adding enough value. When you work for a company, for example, you didn't add value, you didn't have a result, but because of some politics there, some shady stuff, sometimes you got the money. That's false merit. And why does wisdom disapprove of false recognition? 
because if you lack discernment, that result you obtained without producing something in return, it evaporates. Just look at the number of individuals who participate in the lottery and fail because it's not worth receiving something without being ready for it. Not being someone who possesses wisdom because you won't keep that wealth with you. So it's pointless. The only root is the root of wisdom. If you don't become more enlightened, you'll lose what you've achieved effortlessly. Second principle, those who do not seek wisdom stumble into the unknown. What does this mean? It means that when you don't seek wisdom, in some cases, knowledge, what happens is that you tread a path and because of the lack of wisdom of you not having knowledge, which are two different things, and you're on a path you don't know where it leads, you'll stumble. You always stumble on the path. In fact, here's a great tip right away, which is you should never walk alone because if you don't walk alone, when you stumble, you'll have someone to hold on to. But on this path, what happens if you don't know where you're going, you'll stumble several times, and without wisdom, knowledge, you don't know what made you stumble. So if you're going to invest your money and you don't have knowledge, you don't have wisdom, you're going to make mistakes. But sometimes you'll think you made a mistake because the dollar fell, or because the dollar rose, or because China did something, or because something changed in politics, etc. However, in some situations, the real problem may lie in the lack of knowledge, resulting in the misunderstanding of inappropriate financial decisions. Personally, I have made several financial mistakes, initially attributing them to a specific cause, only to later discover that the root of the problem was another, thanks to my efforts to study and learn from these experiences. Third principle is foolishness. Do you know what a foolish person is? A foolish person is someone who, when they know what they should do and they don't, is the one who, aware of what they should do, chooses not to do it. If they are unaware of what to do, they are considered ignorant. Many viewers of this video may reflect, wow, what would it be like to have watched this video when younger? So they didn't invest because they were ignorant. The person who knows they need to invest and yet doesn't is foolish. An overweight person who knows they need to exercise and diet and yet doesn't is a foolish person. For example, so have discipline, as Solomon said. Discipline is the tool to combat foolishness. Without discipline, you break the diet, you stop investing to spend money on frivolities or even spend money on casino games, I know. Jokes aside, let's go to the fourth principle. The fourth principle is the principle of laziness. Look here. Lazy hands make for poverty, so what he means here is this. That person who is lazy and doesn't get anywhere, who procrastinates in everything, who puts off everything, from the day they'll invest, even to the day they'll start the gym. Success doesn't accept laziness, in other words, that's because laziness and sloth make a person poor. Fifth principle, plant your seeds and don't depend on just one of them. Let's go. Do you know what convexity means? Convexity is something convex. An action can turn to dust or multiply several times. The problem is that if you invest in a single stock, if it falls, you've lost 100% of what you had. That's why you need to diversify your investments. If you invested in 10 stocks, one fell 100%, eight doubled in value, and one stayed at the same level, you won't suffer losses. The seed is a metaphor for planting to harvest later. What's the problem here? Many people only want the fruit. You know that relative who asks to borrow money from you, they're only taking the fruit. Or that person who works at a company and only gets a little of the outcome, they're satisfied with that. They always need to live off that fruit, never have any leftover to plant, or they never have to invest before consuming the fruit because that's how the person survives. But if you don't have any seeds left to plant, you can't grow and you remain dependent on what you're doing. That's why you always have to plant different seeds because sometimes one seed won't grow, but another will. That will grow and give you many fruits. And if you follow the flow, some of these fruits you eat and others you can replant. It's like investments. A part is dividends in the future that we use to survive, another part we leave to invest. Sixth principle of Solomon, 
Working hard is not always enough. Why? Because effort is part of the trajectory that will bring you prosperity. On the other hand, only working is not enough if you don't add value and don't scale what you do. You need to have merit. Merit has more to do with how much you earn than with the effort you put in. But of course, in the equation, effort will enhance the result you generate, and therefore the result you'll have. It's an old maxim if you dig a hole, so what? You'll be all sweaty, tired, dirty, but you haven't added value to anyone, that's the point. You need to add value. You need to be in a meritocratic environment, and you need to scale what you do. The seventh and final principle is that wisdom is not knowledge. So we can look at several people who invest in the stock market. They have a lot of knowledge. People have a lot of knowledge indeed. When you talk to one of them, you feel stupid. Oh my goodness, I don't know anything. I spent so much time not knowing anything, and the person knows much more than you. They're full of knowledge. But it doesn't mean they'll be the best investor in the long run, because you also need wisdom. Wisdom has to do with something much more than knowledge. It's about your experience. It's about practice, action. Wisdom is putting knowledge into practice and getting good results. And that only happens when you have practical experience in the things you do. Knowledge alone is theoretical. It becomes wisdom only when you put it into practice and bear good fruit. Imagine you want to get your driver's license without taking lessons, claiming that you already know how to drive very well because you're the best at playing GTA. Yes, you theoretically have good knowledge of driving a car or a motorcycle, but does it work in practice? No, because you've never driven a real car in practice. Theoretically, you can be the best, but in practice, I don't think so. I hope you'll forgive me for the simplistic analogy. But my intention here is to make things as clear and easy to understand as possible. Check out now the five main habits that you cannot have. If you do, it is very likely that you will experience financial difficulties. So once again, the Bible warns about five habits that we must avoid to get rich. Would you like to have a prosperous life? If so, this video was made for you. Watch attentively every second and your bank account will thank you later. Well, let's get started. Did you know that our lives are shaped by our habits? Successful habits make people thrive, while bad habits make people fail. Knowing this can change not only your financial life, but your entire life. We've already recorded a complete video on the eight best habits that lead to prosperity according to biblical teachings. Still, I see that almost no one talks about the bad habits that impoverish. You must be very careful with this. Pay close attention because I will talk about the five terrible habits harmful to your finances according to biblical principles. Knowing these habits, you can eliminate them from your life and you and your family will be much more prosperous because of a decision you made. Grab pen and paper and take notes. The first impoverishing habit, the habit of spending everything you earn. The vast majority of people spend absolutely all the money they receive. This is not an opinion. It is a fact proven by numerous studies. A survey by the National Confederation of Shopkeepers, CNDL, found that 67% of the American population spends everything they receive. This number is alarming, but some may justify the habit of spending everything due to the country's low wages. Most people save nothing because it's impossible to save on a low income. However, the economic situation, low wages, and financial vulnerability contribute to people having the habit of spending everything they earn. This leads to poverty because those who spend everything are always living on the financial edge. It's all wrong. If an unforeseen event happens, what do you do? Think about it. You probably know people who are in good condition. But due to a single unforeseen event, unemployment, medical leave, a traffic accident, causing high expenses, everything financially unraveled to the point of a financial crisis. Don't be deceived. One of the biblical functions of money is protection. Yes, money serves to protect you from the unforeseen. That's what the Bible says. Wisdom serves as a defense, just as money does. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 12. 
If you want a more prosperous financial life and to stay away from poverty, you need to eliminate the habit of spending everything you earn and start saving part of your income. You might be thinking, I spend everything because I earn very little. No, 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 that's not the problem. A study was also conducted with people earning six figures per year, and believe it or not, they also spend everything they earn. If you earn $1,000 today, you'll find a way to spend that $1,000. If you earn $5,000, you'll also find a way to spend it all. If you earn $50,000 per month, believe me, you'll find a way to spend it all because this habit is ingrained in you. The Bible itself said, whoever is faithful with little will also be faithful with much, and whoever is unfaithful with little will also be unfaithful with much. Correct this habit while you still have time. Set aside a small amount, even if it's $10 a month, because in the beginning, the amount is not so important, but the habit is. Develop this habit, and later you will thank me. The second impoverishing habit, habit of acquiring only liabilities. Do you know what that is? In the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, we can find one of the most transformative concepts about personal finance. This concept revolves around the definition of assets and liabilities. Robert Kiyosaki defines an asset as anything that puts money in your pocket and a liability as anything that takes money out of your pocket. It's as simple as that. Assets put money in your pocket, liabilities take money out of your pocket. For example, if you buy a car to show off to your neighbors that you have a new car, congratulations, you've just acquired a liability. But if you bought a new car to do deliveries and work as a taxi driver, congratulations, you've acquired an asset. Do you see the difference? Assets are things you buy that in some way put money in your pocket, while liabilities are things you buy that never put money in your pocket. Let me ask you, as an intelligent person, is an iPhone an asset or a liability? The answer is, it depends. If you bought the iPhone just because it's trendy and to appear wealthier, it's a liability. However, if you bought the iPhone to take advantage of the quality of the camera and want to record videos for social media to monetize your content, well, that would indeed be a great investment. And in this case, your iPhone would be an asset. Many people have the habit of buying only liabilities, things that only take money out of their pockets, such as clothes, electronics, cars, video games, TVs, and so on. I ask for your complete attention again. The habit of buying only liabilities hides a fatal trap, a trap that has been the doorway to poverty for many. Think about it. If you prioritize buying assets instead of liabilities, meaning if you prioritize buying things that put money in your pocket, the tendency is that you will have more money over time. Work, receive your salary, buy an asset, then receive money generated by that asset along with your work income and buy more assets. Now that you have more assets, you receive more money from these assets and you can buy even more assets. The result is a positive snowball effect, money generating more and more money. However, the opposite also happens. If you prioritize buying liabilities, that is, things that take money out of your pocket, the tendency is that you will have less money over time. So you work, receive your salary, buy a liability. This liability generates more expenses, then you have to work more. And by working more, you buy more liabilities that end up generating more expenses and so you end up having to work even more. You enter a sequence of tragic financial pitfalls. Each day, your expenses increase and your salary seems to slip through your fingers. This path, called by Robert Kiyosaki, the rat race, inevitably leads to financial poverty. The Bible draws our attention to reflect on the things we buy. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fare. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 2. We need to buy liabilities to live, but we must plan throughout our lives to use part of our resources to buy things that also generate more income. To be direct, my advice is as follows. Set aside part of your salary to buy assets, to buy things that put money in your pocket. 
allocate part of your money to buy rental properties, stocks, real estate funds, set aside part of your salary to invest in the future. All of this will keep you away from poverty and lead you towards financial prosperity. The third impoverishing habit, habit of debt. Most people love buying on installment, enjoying paying interest for each installment, but there's a serious problem here. And to complicate matters, there has never been as much credit availability as today. It has never been so easy to take out loans and financing as it is today. If you need to renovate your house, buy a car, or purchase a cell phone and don't have the money, no problem. You already have pre-approved credit available in your bank account. Or you can go to the bank and take out a loan deducted directly from your salary. Think about it. A few decades ago, this didn't happen. If you wanted to buy a car, a house, or anything else, you had to save money to buy it. All this ease has turned us into a society extremely dependent on loans. Indeed, this credit ease, combined with the lack of financial education in our schools, creates a society that believes it can only achieve things through financing and loans. Today, it's common to hear people saying with resignation, we can't get anything. The life of the poor is this way, from one financing to another. Perhaps you know people who believe this. Perhaps you know people who act like this, who have the habit of debt, the act of buying everything through financing and loans. Perhaps you yourself are that person. Perhaps you've been watching a significant portion of your salary being consumed by loans for years. The habit of debt leads to poverty. Why? Because those who buy everything through debt, that is, everything through loans and financing, always end up paying interest, spending more to get less. Thus, this is one of the reasons why many debts are considered, as the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. If you take out many loans, you know how enslaving they can be. This biblical passage is true because those in debt spend a significant portion of their salary paying interest on their loans. In fact, it's very common in financing to pay even double what was necessary. That's why the borrower is a slave to the lender. God doesn't want you to be a slave to anyone, as written in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 23. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. In summary, having the habit of debt is akin to having the habit of being a slave, of throwing money away, of wasting the money that God gave you. The fourth impoverishing habit, the habit of thinking only in the present. What are your financial plans for five years from now and for 10 years? What about 20 years? Unfortunately, few have answers to these questions. This happens because many have the habit of thinking only in the short term, a financial myopia where the person only sees what is near and forgets about the distant, forgets about the future. Many make financial plans only for the new year on New Year's Eve. Many say on New Year's Eve, this year I will increase my salary, I will start investing in stocks, I will do this and that and so on. Don't get me wrong, the habit of making New Year's plans is not wrong. What's wrong is the habit of thinking only in the short term, of making plans only for the next year, of just thinking in the short term. It is because of this habit that many face difficulties in retirement, including many who worked their whole lives, paid their taxes, and had a life of dedication. Everything needs to be planned, needs to be planted first before it can be harvested. You don't build a solid business overnight, you don't create a financial reserve overnight, and you won't see the results of your investments overnight. As the scripture says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. But it doesn't stop there. There's also another side effect of the habit of thinking only in the short term. Thinking only in the short term makes us believe that we won't get very far in five or ten years. Yes, you can make plans for the next year, but you can also have the habit of thinking long term. Just imagine what you can achieve in ten years. You can have a successful business of your own, acquire your own home, achieve financial independence. Empires are not built overnight. 
Long-term plans need to be made, need to be planted, and then harvested. The fifth impoverishing habit is the habit of praying a lot and doing little. Learn something. Prayer is nothing more than praying and acting, that's why it's called prayer, a combination of praying and action. Many people pray with great faith, but with little effort. Learn something, pray and trust in God as if everything depends on Him, but act as if everything depends on you. Consider these biblical verses. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Notice how prayer begins to unite with action. When learning about investments, it's essential to learn to invest in stocks, real estate funds, and in government bonds. If the desire is to own a house, in addition to praying, it's crucial to start acting and planning. Begin the journey of saving money, and by doing so, you can multiply it, accelerating the realization of the dream of home ownership. There is unimaginable power in the combination of prayer and action. These are the five acts that can lead to financial poverty, and not practicing them would be like praying without acting. So start acting to change your habits today. Now you will know the three main mistakes you should not make if you want to be rich one day. The Bible addresses this topic very seriously, so pay close attention. Are you always wondering why you work so hard but have a less prosperous life? A lot of work and little money. Maybe you're making mistakes described in the Bible, the book of life. So pay attention to this video if you truly want to change your life and turn the tide. Regardless of your belief, biblical teachings can be extremely fundamental for your life as a whole, including your financial life. Want to attract more wealth into your life? Then comment like this, I am a blessed person. Just comment this, I am a blessed person, because positive affirmations are essential as sacred scriptures affirm. Words and faith are very powerful, so if you have already commented, let's continue. Today, we will see three mistakes that make you poorer, according to biblical teachings. Three financial mistakes based on the Holy Bible will be highlighted here. I will address financial failures that are leading people to poverty, resulting from misconceptions of sacred scriptures. I'll tell you up front, you might be making at least one of these mistakes. Most worrying is that each of them can compromise your spiritual, professional, and financial life. Therefore, it's crucial for us to understand what the Bible teaches about our finances. After all, such understanding will free you from many financial problems, organize your financial life, and enable the adoption of good financial habits that will lead you to a much more prosperous life. So, if you want to minimize the financial mistakes that a large part of the population makes, get out of the red, or improve your financial health, stay with me and get to know the three major financial misconceptions based on flawed interpretations of the Holy Bible. Remember, if you've come this far, that's a good sign. A sign that you're determined to change your life. A sign that you're ahead of 99% of the people who, by now, have already left the video. Stay until the end. Sometimes a video can be the turning point that will change the course of your life for the better. First misconception based on the Bible, considering work as a punishment. Many people think that work was a punishment from God for Adam's sin. This thought is based on the text of Genesis chapter 3 verse 17, which states that after the fall, Adam had to toil with the sweat of his brow to earn his living. However, the account in Genesis makes it clear that Adam was already working before sinning. Furthermore, he was working by God's order, Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. God the Father works just as Jesus does. My Father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working, John 5:17. Now think with me, 
How could Jesus accomplish something that would be a punishment for sin, since he never sinned? Don't delude yourself by saying or thinking that work is a divine penalty. Those who think like this tend not to be good professionals. Those who believe this won't seek courses in their field, won't strive to get a good curriculum, won't participate in lectures, professional events, and won't progress in their career. Consequently, someone who sees work as a punishment will possibly have a low income, face financial problems and all their consequences, stress, anxiety, conflicts, etc. You don't want that, neither for yourself nor for those you love. Obviously, God doesn't want that for you either. He doesn't want you to see work as a punishment because work is not a punishment. Work was a divine order that preceded man's first sin. And here, it's worth mentioning a truth that not everyone likes to hear. It was God who instituted work. If he instituted it, he wants you to take pleasure in your work, just as the Bible states, whoever plows should plow in hope, and whoever threshes should do so in hope of sharing in the harvest. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. Yes, this verse is in a broader context, in the context of the kingdom, but it addresses work. Therefore, trust in work, work with hope, with faith, for without faith, it is impossible to achieve something of value. Moreover, work as if it were for God himself, as the book of Colossians recommends. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians chapter 3 verse 17. Second misconception, believing that money is evil. If you became rich, it's because you engaged in illicit actions. The rich won't inherit heaven. Money is the root of all evil. Before anything else, you may already imagine that I will say that these thoughts are mistaken. Yes, they are mistaken, but before explaining why these ideas are wrong, it's worth mentioning that if you hold such thoughts, you will never be prosperous. Think about it. If you believe that those who become wealthy do so because they steal, and you receive a considerable amount, whether through a promotion at work, an inheritance, or a sale of some property, you'll feel compelled to squander that money on extravagances. After all, your subconscious cries out, those who become rich are dishonest, and as a good Christian, you don't want to be dishonest. It may seem exaggerated, but such thoughts are responsible for the financial failure of many Christians, more specifically, thoughts like these may be undermining your financial potential. For example, if you believe that the rich won't inherit heaven, do you really think you'll have the motivation to get an undergraduate degree, a postgraduate degree, a master's, a PhD, and vocational courses to become a better professional and consequently earn more? Of course not. Thinking that the rich won't inherit heaven and that money is the root of all evil is a misconception. Furthermore, such thoughts are based on mistaken interpretations of the Holy Bible. In 1 Timothy, we find one of the verses that is misinterpreted. It says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10 Observe the verse. It doesn't say that money is the root of all evil, no. It says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Observe the obvious. Money itself neither does good nor harm to anyone. A hundred dollar bill cannot rob or kill anyone. Money is an inanimate object. It cannot cause harm or good by itself, that's a fact. However, there is another fact. Money can be used for both evil and good. You can use money to bribe a policeman, but you can also use it to help someone in need. Therefore, being good or bad is not in money, but in what we do with it. So I ask you, what have you been doing with the money that God has placed in your hands? Third, financial misconception. Based on a mistaken interpretation of the Holy Bible, believing that money isn't that important. Unfortunately, you've probably uttered or heard expressions like, I don't worry about money. Money isn't crucial. Money is synonymous with worry. The truth is that thoughts like these contradict God's financial plan for you, as revealed in the scriptures. God considers money very important. 
which is why the Bible is filled with financial teachings. For example, out of the 613 laws described in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, over a hundred address money-related topics. Jesus discussed money in parables and teachings. About 80 times, almost half of the Master's parables are related to financial matters. Approximately 20% of the Sermon on the Mount, considered by many as Christ's most important sermon, mentions financial issues. Believing that money isn't crucial is deceiving yourself. More than just deceiving yourself, it condemns your financial life to failure. Think with me, if you told your spouse that they weren't crucial to you, would they stay by your side? If you told a friend that they weren't crucial to you, would they stick around? If you declared to your employer or employee that they weren't crucial, would they stay with you? Would you have a car if it wasn't crucial to you? Would you have a pet if it wasn't crucial? The answer is no, of course not. If you assert that your spouse isn't crucial, they will distance themselves or leave, seeking someone who considers them crucial. Here, remember some people who claim that money isn't crucial. Maybe that friend of yours, co-worker or relative, reflects on the financial life of that person. Do they have a good financial life, or do they live with financial difficulties, with financial deprivation? When I analyzed people I knew who believed that money wasn't crucial, I realized that all of them had a completely unbalanced financial life. They were full of debts and financial problems. Robert Kiyosaki, author of the best-selling book Rich Dad, Poor Dad, once said, Money isn't the most important thing in the world, but it affects all the things that are important. It's necessary to recognize the proper importance of money so that it isn't more or less than what it really is. Money is crucial, very crucial. This doesn't mean it's the most important thing in the world, but rather that it's extremely crucial and cannot be ignored. Therefore, don't ignore money in your life. Don't overlook that you'll have to budget, plan, save, invest, purchase wisely, donate, contribute. You'll have to sustain yourself, sustain your family, pay the bills, feed yourself, drink, pay taxes. And as you already know, all this requires money, so you need to receive money. Hence, you need to work, generate active and passive income. There's no escaping it. Money is crucial and you cannot ignore it. Let's review what we've learned in this video. First, work isn't a punishment. Don't see work as divine punishment. It was already happening before sin, and God instituted work as an order, not as punishment. Approach work with hope and do it as if you were serving God. Second, money isn't evil. Don't believe that becoming wealthy is dishonest. Negative thoughts about money can harm your financial success. Money itself isn't evil, it's how you use it that makes a difference. The love of money is the issue, not money itself. Third, money is crucial. Recognize the importance of money. Thinking that money isn't crucial goes against God's financial plan. According to the Bible, over a hundred biblical laws address financial topics, showing that God considers money important. Ignoring this can lead to financial problems. Such misconceptions aren't just mistaken ideas or wrong thoughts. They lead people to make financial decisions that will lead them to poverty and misery. Therefore, evaluate and reevaluate each of these misconceptions. Identify which mistaken thoughts you possess and take steps to change, to pave the way for prosperity. Now that we've talked about things that can keep you in poverty, let's briefly discuss three habits that enrich according to the Holy Bible. The Bible presents principles that can be used in financial management and the enrichment process. Here are three habits that can be considered relevant for financial prosperity in light of the scriptures. First habit, wise resource management. Reference verse Luke 16 verse 10. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Teaching. The Bible emphasizes the importance of faithfulness in managing financial resources. Cultivating habits of responsibility and diligence in managing money, even in small things, is seen as a solid foundation. Second habit, dedicated and honest work. Reference verse Proverbs 14 verse 23. 
All hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Teaching. The Bible encourages hard and honest work as a means to prosper financially. Dedication to work and striving for excellence are values that can lead to long-term success. Third habit, financial planning and prudence. Reference verse Proverbs 21 verse 5. The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. Teaching. The Bible highlights the importance of planning and prudence in financial decisions. Developing a budget, saving and investing wisely are habits that can lead to a more prosperous financial life. If you've watched this far, comment like this, I watched the whole video. This shows that you really are a persistent person, so comment, I watched the whole video. I will give a heart to your comment and I will wait for the next video.